This is the third part of my video series on the making of SWAT Global Strike Team. In this video I'm going to explain a little about how Ochre, SWAT's rendering engine, handled lighting. As, at least originally, an Xbox only title, we wanted to take full advantage of all the cool pixel and vertex shader technology at our disposal, so per pixel lighting was a given. Additionally, from a gameplay point of view, we wanted to be able to let the player shoot out the lights to plunge the enemies into darkness, so that was another consideration. Finally, we wanted a proper shadowing solution that didn't rely on the texture-based solution of the time, light maps, as used in Quake and so on. We didn't think we could store all the light maps for a single level in memory, as our levels were outdoor and rather sprawling. With that in mind, we wanted to generate the static scenery shadows geometrically. Nick Hemmings worked his magic and came up with a solution. For every light in the game, find all the scenery triangles that face the light and are within that light's range. Here the white circle represents a light and this yellow triangle is an example of a piece of geometry that is casting a shadow onto the red and blue triangle below. For each of these triangles, calculate the shadow volume that it casts by projecting through all the edges of the triangle. Intersect all the other triangles with this volume and discard the parts that are inside the volume. This creates non-triangular shapes. We re-triangulate and store this new set of triangles. We end up with a set of geometry per light containing just the parts of the scenery that are affected by that light. This data will be used to draw the geometry lit by this light where each light's contribution to the scene is added on one after another. I'll describe this process in detail in the next video. We end up with a lot more geometry, one piece per light per chunk of original scene geometry. This sounds simple enough, but it was pretty tricky. Double floating point precision wasn't good enough. Repeatedly clipping tiny slivers of triangles against each other can cause them to turn inside out, where precision errors cause an anti-clockwise triangle to become clockwise. It can also leave almost infinitesimally small polygons. There was the sheer amount of work involved, hundreds of lights in a landscape of hundreds of thousands of polygons. Nick came up with some great solutions to these problems. Every edge was given a unique 64-bit ID. During clipping, this edge ID was preserved and later used to discover triangle edges that were on the same original edge. These could then be welded back together after all the clipping had been performed with no loss of accuracy. We distributed the geometry calculation across many machines using FileServe. Light geometry and its resulting shadowscape were heavily cached between conversions. A hash of the light position and the geometry it could potentially affect was used as the cache key. An artist or designer moving one light a little, or editing a few triangles, only caused the recalculation of a small area of the map. There were still a few cases where the algorithm didn't work, usually because of broken source artwork. It was left to the artist to fix up the geometry to get the level converting correctly, removing coincident triangles, welding nearly identical vertices and fixing non-manifold edges. These shadows were great, being relatively cheap at runtime, but they were limited to static scenery and non-moving lights. We could vary the intensity and colour of the lights at runtime, but not their position. They also lent themselves well to the PlayStation 2 engine, which, if you recall from my earlier video, was a bit of an afterthought. Ochre also supported real-time shadows on the Xbox, using a stencil-based approach. In the final cut of SWAT, much to my and Nick's annoyance, the character shadows were dropped due to a perceived speed problem. They were expensive, particularly on the skinned animating characters, but they weren't bad enough to drop them entirely, as far as I recall anyway. Another cool feature of the lighting system was its simulation of a real film camera. After rendering, the entire screen was post-processed to simulate film's non-linear response to light and the aperture of a virtual camera. A further post-process would bleed out very bright areas. We sampled back a set of pixels near the centre of the screen every frame and used this to adjust the aperture for the next frame, simulating auto-exposure. When the player went from a dark room to the bright outside, this would momentarily dazzle them until the aperture closed a little. Glancing back at the dark room, the player would then only see a pitch black area, just as in real life. A similar effect was also used to simulate the temporary dazzling caused by the bright light of a flashbang grenade. In the next video, I'll talk more specifically about how the Xbox renderer worked. Don't forget to subscribe if you'd like to find out when that video is available, and check out the other SWAT and programming videos I have available.